The 747 is one of the most iconic aircrafts in history. It's known for their distinctive features such as the hump, four engines, and too many wheels. Yet, it's regarded as one of the most beautiful planes out there. But what's the story of this plane? How did it become so famous? To understand, we must go back in time to the 1960s, a time when people care so much about their opinions that it's worth making enough weapons to wipe out the world many times over just to emphasize it. At the time, the US Air Force was dreaming about a giant cargo plane, a plane with twice the low capacity as their largest plane, and only to be powered by four engines. Both were enormous challenges, so the Air Force looked to the leading aircraft manufacturers for design studies, Boeing, Lockheed, and Douglas for the airframe, and Pram Whitney and GE for the engines. Boeing proposed a unique design, which includes a cockpit hump to ease loading through the nose, and in general had an innovative design overall. The Air Force took note of this, gave them an A, and chose the design from Lockheed. Apparently theirs were cheaper or something. In a hissy fit, Boeing left the program, and to show everybody what they'll be missing, they accelerated the development of their own large transport. So they threw together what they got, including the Pram Whitney engine design left behind by the Air Force program, to create an entirely new plane. Keep in mind that Boeing was also trying to fund other projects, like their supersonic transport, so they can be like the cool kids. More on that in like 30 seconds. With both programs eating into Boeing's reserves, the company was running short on cash. Fortunately, they found help from their longtime BFF, Pan Am. Oops, sorry, uh, search history. Pan Am. They were looking for an oversized jet, and when they heard Boeing was building this one, they were super excited, fell in love with it, and ordered 25. Among with orders from other airlines, Boeing at least had the confidence to follow through. But this wouldn't change the fact that the 747 program was really just a side gig to Boeing's main program, the Supersonic Transport, or SST for short. At the time, the industry believed that supersonic travel was the way of the future, and manufacturers around the world were racing to build the first SST. I mean, it seemed pretty obvious at the time that subsonic travel will become a thing of the past. Like, if people had the choice, they would want to get to their destination in half the time. They choose to fly 1,300 miles an hour. 600 miles an hour in a 747? <laughs> Boeing and their customers knew about this and chose to design the 747 to look more like a cargo plane. And that's why the cockpit hump is there so that it can be out of the way when the cargo goes through the nose. The idea was that the planes can be sold as freighters, or be converted into them after they lose their edge in the passenger market, with the hope that they can still remain competitive in the cargo market, for as long as boxes of lobsters and tulips aren't going to start complaining about taking twice as long to get to their holidays in the Maldives. But sure, 747s can keep their seats on champagne for the time being, but they know, sooner or later, they're destined to end their careers as cargo jets. And they'll be great at it. But then, stuff changed. To put it short, the SST programs around the world ran to political and economic issues. Boeing ended up canceling theirs. Only two types of SSTs were produced. The Tu-144 by the Soviets, and the Concorde by the British and the French. The Tu-144 only saw limited service before their careers were cut short, and although the Concorde did better, only a handful were ever built, and they would spend the rest of their lives with their parents. Suddenly, the world opened up to the 747. No more obstacles were in the way of what would now be known as the Queen of the Skies. Oh sure, there were technically competitors like the DC-10 and L-1011, but they couldn't carry as many people, nor fly as far. So, whatever. For the next few decades, the Queen ruled the skies and became the must-have plane. You don't have an airline unless you have a 747. It's like the equivalence of a world superpower without an aircraft carrier, or a space program, or at least once breaking the Geneva Convention. As the orders piled up, Boeing began creating different variants of the plane. The 747-200, which offered higher takeoff weight. The 300, which featured a longer hump. The SR for short-range flights and the SP for shorter plane, er, special performance. But perhaps the most iconic version of all was the 400. It features the same longer hump as the 300, but uses more efficient engines, includes a series of aerodynamic refinements, and has the ability to upset labor unions. 
These changes allowed the 400 to become the most popular variant of them all. The 747 program entered an era of record sales, becoming the most popular wide-body jet in history, and continued to reign unopposed until the new millennia, when a new plane finally arose from the shadowy depths of the industry, a plane that would finally challenge the Queen's dominance face to face. It was designed to utilize modern aerodynamic principles, modernized flight systems, and far more powerful engines all the while resulting in a plane that is far more fuel efficient and cheaper to operate. It is, of course, the 777. Although it started off as a smaller plane, after finding a box of Viagra, it became a firm competitor of the 747. And while others like the DC-10 and L-1011 have technically competed over the 747, the 777 can carry almost just as much, fly just as far, and uses only half the number of engines. Now I'm sure some of you out there are probably going, oh well they're two complete separate classes of planes, it's like comparing apples and oranges. Yes, they're both fruits, competing in the same fruit market, and if apples are 30% cheaper, I'll skip the oranges and shake off my vitamin C deficiency. Most airlines agreed. They crunched the numbers, they weighed their pros and cons, and began replacing their aging fleet of 747s with 777s. Now, Boeing did develop a new 747 that is even bigger and can compete in terms of fuel efficiency, but it wouldn't change the fact that its operating cost is still pretty high, and it relies on a dying business model. So, airlines continued ditching for long-range twins like the 777 and eventually the 787 and A350. The 747 had nowhere left to stand, with one exception. Remember how the plane was designed to be cargo friendly, so that it can have a second chance after it loses its edge in the passenger market? The hump, the nose loading, something regular planes don't have and can't do? Yeah, that. Turns out that's still a thing. Bingo, they found a market. 50 years after Boeing had made their prediction about the 747, it finally came true and came to the rescue. And yes, I know freighter variants were sold since the 1970s, and also yes, I wouldn't ultimately save the 747, but at least the program can come to a more dignifying end, with about 150 orders for the final variants. That is noteworthy. To have a 50-year-old prediction become the plane's saving grace in the present day really speaks to the expertise of those who designed and built the plane. It also speaks to the forward-thinking values of the company, one that values innovation, engineering, and a long-term vision over short-term profits. Values that I'm sure are still guiding Boeing to this day. Yep. Oh yeah, there's this other plane called the A380. It's larger than the 747 and the 777, but it only turned out to be a bit of a fad. Once again, it had too many engines, used as an obsolete business model, but perhaps its most fatal flaw of all was that it was about a 4.